hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Polar Opposites. Um, we're going to change up the format a little bit. Uh, I, CP, am on a two-week losing streak, so I'm running for the hills. I'm, I'm sick of losing. I'm not even going to try anymore. I'm not debating. Uh, Annie Aggins is the two-week running champion, and Eric, the former moderator, is uh, going to jump in and try his hand at debating. We are very lucky this week to also be joined by longtime Polar Explorers Guide and all-around outdoor expert, Mr. Keith Hager. Keith, how you doing? Fantastic. Thanks, Chris. Right thanks, Annie. Yeah, thanks, thanks for coming on, Keith. Keith nice has to been have guiding. you here, Keith. Yeah. Keith has been guiding with Polar Explorers since 2005, and he's been to the North Year every year since then, barring the last two where no one went. Uh, been to Greenland, South Pole. He's been all over the world. So he's got a lot of great gear opinions. Keith, what's your favorite piece of gear? Oh, that's a tough question, CP. You know, the one piece of gear I don't leave home with without is my uh, tent jacket. I mm. Polar Explorer's tent jacket by StormTech. That thing has seen a lot of wear and tear and, uh, it's uh, synthetic filled, so it works in those wet climates. Um, it's got some nice zippered inner pockets, and it's got really durable tooth zippers, which I which I prefer over the coil zipper. Nice. Does that thing have a hood on it? It's got a hood on it. Yes. Yeah. You got to get the hood. They they it does come without a hood, but you got to go with the hood. Very important. I agree. Got all right. Check. It's nice. I have the same one, and I wear it all the time. Yeah, most definitely, I and I like sunglasses that. because that's my favorite piece of kit. But really, the tent <laughs> jacket is the one I leave. I don't leave home without. Yeah, you love your cranial accessories, don't you? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump right into the debate. This week, we're talking about cooking. Where do you like to do it? In the tent, in the in tent, tent body, body, or in the vestibule? Yeah. Um, people have their opinions. I know Eric and Annie do not agree on this, and I'm not quite sure where Keith stands. So We're also going to be doing our top three favorite stoves. That's correct. Actually, let's start with that. Good call, Annie. Um, so I'll start with mine. My, uh, I've only got two. They've, they haven't, they haven't yeah, ever let me down. Now. So my top choice is the MSR yeah. Whisperlite. Super small, very reliable, super lightweight. Uh, and then I also like the Coleman 424. That's a two burner stove, so you can get um, a pot of water on and then fry up some quesadillas at the same time. I like that. How about you, Annie? Which model Whisper Light? The International, the Universal, or the Standard? I, I like the International. Yeah, I. So I'll I, go next. Mine's the Universal. Okay. I just upgraded my International to the Universal, and that allows me to change the fitting on the fuel line to put on the isobutane canisters. So I still oh, get the platform and the line of the whisper light, but I can put on a canister stove when I want to go lighter, not as light as the canister stoves um, as a single unit, but um, the universal is the way to go. Interesting. Gotcha. gotcha. What's your number two? Yeah. yeah, what's your number two? Oh, there is no number two. They call it the universal. You don't need it. Exactly. I, I will tell you, I did get a new toy recently. I got the Blackstone 22-inch uh, griddle that runs on propane, and that'll change your car camping cooking scene immediately. Flat top, <laughs> flat top griddle. It's unbelievable. Oh, okay. Nice. We'll have, have to check that out. We will have to check that out. Wow. Eric, All right, you Annie. Too. Oh, sorry. What do you? What's your favorite stove, Annie? Uh, my favorite. Uh, well, my favorite is the Optimus One Eleven B, which is a stove that um, that's just awesome all around. And I, it's really like a bomb. You can't really destroy the thing unless you try really, really hard. It comes in its own case, which you open up a metal case, which you open up, and the the fuel tank rolls out. And um, it's just great. I love everything about it, but it's a, it's heavy. It's got a great cooking platform. It's like got it's like got all the advantages of your four two four double burner 
stove. It's got its own little platform and uh, which, which increases the safety. If there's any kind of a fuel leak, you know, it's self-contained, you can shut the lid, but it's one small burner. So it's half, it's a lot, probably a lot more than half the weight, but it's still heavy. So when I got to think about weights, and I actually haven't used that 111 in a long time. I do use the uh, the Whisper Light, and I use Whisper Light International. That's my one. That's my number one and my number two. All right, all right. We'll throw it over to our man on the West Coast. There, <laughs> Eric. What do you say? I'm all about the MSR Dragonfly. It's a, Dragonfly. a little bit okay. heavier. It's a little bit heavier. Very similar in function, but uh, it's got a lot more stable cooking platform um, and uh, adjustable flame. So uh, it's a lot easier to tune down when you're making quesadillas. Uh, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to have it tuned in to something other than uh, rocket booster engine speed. Sure. Gotcha. Gotcha. And then, Do you have uh, any, uh, any favorite? Uh, favorite? Uh, second, I think uh, I, I used to cook with this Faya 123 for a long time while I was camping. It's a classic model liquid fuel, uh, you know, built-in container stove. Um, light enough, but not light by today's standards. And uh, I, my my honorable mention has to be just the uh, uh, cast iron cast Dutch oven in the fire pit. Oh yeah, that's a can't that's miss. Not fair. <laughs> that's not fair. <laughs> they, do make, you know, those, they do make those little twiggy stoves, you know, those wood burning stoves that are flat, and you know, you open up and you just feed with twigs and. I use those. I use one of those once, but I had. I went through a lot of twigs. <laughs> <laughs> those are kind of cool. Yeah, I've seen those where you can um, charge electronics with them too while you're cooking. Those yeah. Are very cool. Yeah. All right. I like well, let's get on into the debate section. And Annie, I want to remind you that this is a uh, this is a solo endeavor. No help from your daughters there. I see that they're okay. they're maybe whispering some tips in your ear. They are. They are. They're throwing in some <laughs> info that I have forgotten about stoves. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about whether we cook in the vestibule or in the tent or something totally different. So, Eric, where do you like burning that dragonfly? Oh, I I'm one hundred percent in the vestibule. Uh, and I think it's it's the the clean and clear option uh, as far as where, where you want to cook. For for safety, uh, I mean, I, I've never had to, to apologize to a tent mate for burning their sleeping pad uh, because I don't cook <laughs> inside, inside the tent body. Um, <clears throat> but, oh, I'm gonna get you know, if, if, if you do have a flare up, which we, you know, we, we do have occasionally with those liquid fuel stoves, uh, especially in the cold climates when all the seals aren't, uh, you know, sealed, uh, you know, expanded properly. It's really easy mm -hmm. if you're in the vestibule with the door vented properly to just take that whole thing, tuck it right outside, and you don't have to worry about uh, damaging the tent, damaging yourself, you know, damaging any of your sleeping gear. Um, so, yeah, 100% in the vestibule. Okay. Okay. So some strong points in favor of safety from Eric over there. And uh, maybe a shot fired across Annie's bow. Annie, how do you respond? Well, I think that was a cheap shot, Mr. Lilstrom, about bringing up last week's very <laughs> sensitive topic when I burned Keith's sleeping pad in England. <laughs> a little hole in the inflatable and had to watch him fix it while I drank hot cocoa. Now, <laughs> having said that, I am a firm enthusiast of cooking in the tent. And here's why. It's so relaxing. It's so warm. It's so comfortable. It's very nice. And it's really important on a polar expedition to have some comfort in your life and to have a respite from the cold. And I know that you could say, yeah, you, you can cook in the vestibule and still be comfortable. But we all know that when you can really, when your body can relax, when your muscles can start to relax because you're in a warm environment then that's when they can also start to heal. And so it's also about the longevity of what you're able to do. Cooking in the tent will help you have a more successful expedition in terms of your overall energy level and satisfaction during the course of the day. Now, yes, you do have to be careful. Number one, you do have to be careful. You have to vent. But if you can do that, you're gonna cook faster because it's warmer. You're gonna use less fuel. You're going to be more comfortable, and um, and that's where I'm going to start. 
All right, all right. So in answering safety, we've got comfort, rest, and recuperation for a successful expedition. You know, I'm surprised. I'm surprised that you can really relax when you have a burning stove inside the inner tent. That's uh, how good you know, I am. That, 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 that's that's one of the reasons I why I cook in the best fuel because I can I can set it up. I can keep an eye on it. It's right there in a convenient spot. I, I can keep an eye on the water boiling. And then I can actually use the tent to lay out and relax and and just kind of chill while while the snow is melting. And let, let's be, let, let's just play it out in a scenario. Worst case scenario happens and you get a bad flare up, okay? If your tent, if your stove is inside the tent, you're gonna be putting a hole inside the tent body. You're gonna be, you know, basically burning that tent to the ground and making it unusable for the rest of the expedition. That is an expedition ender right there. But say you have a flare up in the vestibule uh, and you're not able to get to it in time, uh, you know, worst case scenario, you're just going to ruin that vestibule and you can still use that tent for the rest of the expedition. Okay, let's take let's take your things on one, two, three. First of all, flare ups. You you have to monitor the stove really carefully. And but yes, I've survived flare ups in the tent. I have had them before. You have to have a plan for how you're going to evacuate that stove from the tent in a calm and peaceful way. And you leave it on the stove board and you're just going to pick it up and carry it out. You're burning your tent down, A, because most of these tents are made out of flame retardant materials, which are probably making us totally sick. But nonetheless, you're not going to put a hole through your tent right away unless you have like a such a catastrophe that I don't know how it would happen. But you do have to be really smart about it. And you do have to be able to move that tent out, pick up the whole stove board, put it outside, lay it down and not freak out about it. So cooking in the tent is not for everyone. It's for people who are really comfortable with stoves, really comfortable with managing flare ups and things like this and knowing what to do in that situation and having a plan. Now, let's talk about one other thing, and that is the ridiculous difference in our sizes. You are six foot 125 inches, <laughs> and I'm five foot 11. So putting your body, your massive body inside a tent with a burning stove might not be the best idea. But for me and, you know, 90% of the population, it's just a great way to go. All right. Good points on both sides. This debate is heating up and boiling over beyond the moderator's control. Let's get Mr. Hager in on this. Oh, so I'm going to trump both of these two. And I'm going to tell you that you should really be cooking in a separate cook shelter. That way you can invite your fellow team members over. You can use multiple stoves and you have, you're building a sense of community on a daily basis when the entire team can come together in one space and be comfortable and be warm and be fed and be hydrated and they can recap the day. Started to do this recently on some of my expeditions. It's quite popular in the mountaineering world, but to transition from that tool over to the polar world does, does take some creativity. So it's worked for me in the past and I think that a separate cook shelter is the way to go. Okay, okay. so I have a follow up question. <laughs> the uh, the other tents where there is no cooking involved, do they have do they warming have stoves, and where are they where are they located? Okay. Yes, they yes. do have warming yes. stoves, but because there isn't the jeopardy of a hot pot that could spill, and, uh, uh, um, um, so there's no stress of cooking. They can choose to place the stove inside the tent or in the vestibule in order to get that place nice and warm. I'm with you, Keith. I love that idea. And, and you know, for years, our dog sled expeditions did that on every single expedition, just came together and we put six or eight people, CP knows this well, six or eight people in one of those Hillebergs and cram ourselves in there, cook inside the vestibule in this case, because there were so many people in the tent. And it was just a great, because there were so many people in the tent, Eric. <laughs> And it was a really great way to, as you say, unpack the day and share some stories. I mean, really, this is when the group bonding happens, right? When we're all sitting around uh, around the stove talking and communicating and on the shakedowns around the fireplace. Um, so with you on that. However, if you're not bringing a group shelter because you're trying to keep your weight down or whatnot, I'm still with 
cooking inside the tent. You know, Annie, uh, so if you are going to save weight, if you are going to save weight and you're not going to bring an extra cook shelter, then maybe your tent hosts the evening party. It doesn't have to be every day. It could be every other day. And then at that point, if you cram six people in, you might even be cooking outside. If not in the vestibule, you're certainly not going to be cooking in the tent. Well, you know what? You'd be surprised. However, you're probably see six people in the tent. I have done six people in the tent with a warming with a warming stove inside the tent and the meal being cooked Ooh. in the vestibule. And that's you know, really Annie, Annie, I have to say, I, I, I'll, I will give it to you. You are an expert at cooking in the tent. And I completely trust your ability to cook inside the tent body. I, 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 but I what, have, what I, I don't trust I don't on that. is those other people that are in the tent. Because, you know, you're skiing all day. You know, legs are, are a little tired, maybe a little crampy. Someone gets a leg cramp and you've got, you're, you've got a, a stove board with a pot of piping hot water sitting there and someone gets a, a hamstring cramp and their leg goes shooting out. Uh, you know, it, you, you can't manage all of those risks that are, are sitting around you in the form of people inside the tent. So well, while, you, while you are totally capable of cooking inside the tent safely, and I'll give you that. Uh, I, yeah. I think that cooking inside with other people is just not worth the risk to you or your, your tent mates or your equipment. It's, it's well, too I do have an expedition ending incident. I can't think of a time when I have had someone get a leg cramp and have their leg kind of spasm in the tent. However, you're right. You're right. There is a risk involved with it, and you have to be really smart about it. And you have to, you know, usually when I'm cooking in the tent with people, they are on their sleeping bag, laying down, relaxing, total chillax mode. And I'm sitting on one end of the tent, usually the end away from the door, and we're cooking right near the door. I just noticed that we've got a couple of questions here. Um, somebody wanted to know, how much does an extra tent weigh? And so that's a really good question. The extra tent, if you wanted to bring a cooking shelter, they can vary quite a bit, but a cooking, a, a tent with everything in, you guys help me if I'm if I'm wrong here, but I'd say around... 15 pounds with a with the poles and everything like that maybe a floorless cooking shelter maybe around 10 pounds what do you say i'd say that's right it only feels about two though yeah um, is it, was that, so black was diamond uh, mega mid mega light the black diamond mega light the single pole weighs in at about two pounds <laughs> well you're, you definitely want to be carrying an extra tent if you're on an expedition with Annie, who's who's <laughs> cooking inside the tent body, just in case that tent burns down. Hey, listen, listen, Lilstrom. If my tent burned down, I'd have no problem sleeping outside. <laughs> but my tent has never burned down, and That's I've a never. Thing that your sleeping bag doesn't go up with the tent. We, I did actually, I did actually have a uh, a, a stove situation in two thousand. So that's twenty years ago, where we were cooking in the tent and. Um, and the person who I was tenting with, who shall remain unnamed, um, didn't have the fuel cap put on all the way. And we were using, uh, what's, what are those stoves? Um, we were just talking about them. The They're Coleman not accident. the Coleman, the peak ones. And every time he pumped, the fuel, cap, the fuel lid was just open enough that a little bit of fuel would squeak out. And so when, when I lit it, it went and and no problem. We had a plan in place. We picked up the stove. He opened up the zippered. I picked up the stove board, moved it out into the vestibule, let it burn out. However, um, that was an interesting time. <laughs> Imagine if, if you had a person in there that that didn't know the plan and, and didn't react coolly. Like you can't pick up a stove board and unzip the zipper at the same time. Yeah, you don't have that. You don't have that situation going on without a plan in place. That's what I'm saying. You have to have the plan in place. I also see one more question here. I'm not trying to run away from that, but we have one more question here about how do you do any cooking parties in the tents with COVID? Well, that's a that's an interesting question, and uh, I don't think we would be probably doing a party if, with the COVID going on. <laughs> we wouldn't be having a a tent party probably. Yeah, Maybe. we're 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 looking forward to the next time that we're able to do. Uh, you know, tent tent cooking parties. We yeah. certainly have, haven't had the opportunity to field test any methods yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to bring thank in you, uh, oh, bring you. in Keith back into the conversation here. Keith, we were just talking. Yeah, sorry, about, I got. Yeah, 
I saw all that. I was backstage. I was I checked out the chat and, and canceled myself. So he got a little chicken about he started seeing the conversation get heated up and he said, This is my time to exit. <laughs> I just was I just did a vec victory lap. I went outside. <laughs> I won this thing. So H Hager, Hager, in the absence of a communal cooking tent, which which would you use? I am full on vestibule cooker. And really, it's about my tent mates because I really want them to have the time of their lives. They can be nice and warm and on their pads, and I'm happy to do the cooking out in the vestibule. Mm -hmm. so I prefer that method. I, I do. I, I will. I, I will say that, um, uh, you know, at almost 200 pounds, um, at six feet, um, moving around a tent with two other people that are that size, it can it can feel uh, a little bit tight. So. Uh, I prefer using the vestibule space to do that uh, the heavy work. Let me say here that uh, I don't jump in on day one cooking in the tent. And actually, now that I've discovered how comfortable it is to sit in a camp chair inside the vestibule on this last shakedown training we had, I was cooking a in crazy a crazy chair. No, 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 uh, like a chair, you know, one of those foldable chairs. I was cooking in that in the vestibule and it was so wonderful that I, I bought a really lightweight one to bring to the North Pole and I'm not, I'm not going to go back from that and that might change things. I also am about 140 pounds and about five foot nine. So there can be some differences here in terms of size. But as I was saying, I don't start with this on the shakedown. We're not cooking inside the tent unless we do breakfast there in the morning, the second day, and I introduce the concept. But I'm building up to this. Usually by about day three, dinner on day three is usually inside the tent. All right. So my number so, one rule so, of the tent. One last point for me is that unless you have the experience of many, many years, well over 20 years, as Annie illustrated, that you should not be using a stove inside the tent body. Yes, you're there right. Are, there yeah, are you're people right there. who are as skilled in polar expeditions and stove management as Annie is. Uh, <laughs> so I think that ultimately uh, cooking in the vestibule is, even if you're sacrificing a minor, minor bit of comfort, I'm not against warming stoves. I just don't want to have a full tea kettle of four liters of water uh, teetering on my stove in the middle of the tent. Eric's right. We, we need to respect the safety of what we're putting out here on our social media, that this is a, this is an important skill, like a lot of other things. And, um, and you shouldn't start, you shouldn't start by cooking in the tent. There's a lot of things and you shouldn't start by cooking in the vestibule. You should not even be cooking in the vestibule until you're very comfortable with your stove. And you know what kind of a situation you're in, in terms of what other animals might be around at the time. And, uh, you know, a lot of things about your food and your fuel and your gear being everywhere, hanging down, drying, et cetera. So with that all said, thank you for pointing that out, Eric. All right. So CP, what, what do you think? We've been talking for 23 minutes about stoves and vestibules and tent bodies. Uh, what, where, where do we stand right now? Well, you know, the Midwesterner in me hates to pick winners and losers or upset anybody. Uh, and I promise this is... I gave you a birthday present this week. Do you remember? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, Annie, I will award you the uh, the sweetest gift giver in the office award, but I'm going to have to go in favor of cooking in the vestibule based on my history of seeing people's legs cramp up and, uh, and involuntarily shoot in many different directions uh, and also being close to uh, close to Keith's size as well. Um, just, just navigating the inside of the tent with the drawing line and all of that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand this one to the beginners. Split victory for Mr. Lilstrom and Mr. Hager. What would you guys like to say with your victory lap? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead first, and I'll just say, Annie, I have to say, um, I, you, you were, you were climbing an uphill battle on this one. Uh, I'll <laughs> fully acknowledge that. This was an easy first topic for me. Uh, super easy to argue, but. Uh, I would like to piggyback on what you were saying before, which is, uh, you know, we we cook in the in the tent because it's necessary in really cold and windy weather conditions. 
Uh, and if it's not necessary, you absolutely shouldn't. Um, and if you do, there are some really important safety precautions they have to look out for, right? like properly venting, you know, making sure that you know how your stove functions and it's clean and working properly. Um, because, uh, you know, if, if you are not careful, it's easy to have a, a pretty major incident. For example, I, I, I know what it's like to get carbon monoxide poison, poisoning uh, from burning a dirty stove inside an improperly vented tent, and it's not fun. And luckily, it turned out okay. Uh, but please, you know, be sure to only do it if it's absolutely necessary. And then to vent a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Hager, I'll pick you back on that. Lot? I'll pick you back on that. Yeah, you know, um, you you heard in some of the comments, we didn't call it just the stove. We called it the stove system. So. We haven't touched on like pot stability or what type of pot that you're choosing to cook or melt your water. And, you know, we, we found a really unique way to, to melt water, which is a teapot, which can minimize some of the potential to spill. Um, and it's easy to pour and easy to use. So um, I, my, 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 one note, my one piece of advice and what I always ask folks that I'm tenting with is that if the stove is on, somebody's eyes are on that stove at all times. You never take your eyes off the stove. Very yeah. Nice. Hey, I, can I just say Andy. something? <laughs> I want to say something too, even though I didn't win. Um, Absolutely. Jump on in. <laughs> and that, I just want to, I want to piggyback on Keith's piggyback, which is that we do have a pot, we have a whole stove system, exactly as he said, that includes the stove board, includes a stability system to keep that, help keep that pot on top of the stove and to avoid getting jostled off of it. So we have given stoves and cooking in general so much thought because it really is an important part of any trip, especially an expedition trip. And it really is also one of the risks that we can manage by, by giving it a lot of thought in advance. And if you're ever interested in learning what our pot stability system looks like or, um, uh, or how we do some of those things, we'd be happy to share. We do have a great video I wanna add in YouTube. So subscribe to our YouTube channel or go there and um, about the MSR Whisper Light, a wonderful cold weather, how to use the MSR Whisper Light International on an expedition. Excellent, excellent. And I think there are some uh, virtual polar training videos uh, additionally to that. Um, so that, that, unless anyone else has any final comments, that about wraps it up for this edition of Polar Opposites. Uh, great job, everyone. Tune in next time to see if the all-time wins leader gets back in the winner circle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks, all. Bye.